as you are turning in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, let me just say thank you to Doug Clark for filling in for me last week while I was gone. Uh, I, I've already heard from many people what a blessing that was, and so I just want to say thanks to Doug and also to Phil and Paula for, for filling in and, and, and picking up the slack while I was gone and, and being a blessing in my absence. Uh, but it is, it is good to be back. But we're going to look this morning at, at our next core value as a church, and that is living like Christ. So look with me in chapter 9 of Luke, beginning in verse 18. Now it happened that he was praying alone. The disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old is risen. And then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he strictly charged them and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Growing up, I've always been a, a big Beatles fan. And I, I recently read an article. George Harrison, the first guitar, the first nice guitar he purchased, he purchased for about 70 pounds. It was a, it was a Gretsch Duo Jet guitar. And he said this was his favorite guitar. And recently, Gretsch Guitars has commissioned uh, to replicate that, that guitar with all its dings and its nicks to try and get a replica sound. And they were going to make 60 of these guitars. They had a craftsman study and look to try and, and make this guitar exactly like George Harrison's. They even had a CAT scan performed to look at the body of the guitar and, and see the chamber of it and what it looked like and the acoustics of it. And they made this guitar as an exact replica and it was sold, they, they sold each one of these 60 guitars for $20,000 a piece. And it occurred to me that really that whole process is what the life of a Christian ought to be. That is, we find our value in replicating someone else. We find our, our worth in studying the life of Jesus and in living like Jesus and in being replicas of Jesus. This is the call that we have is, is to, to make ourselves like Him, to think as he thought and to act as he acted and to treat others the way Jesus treated others. And, and as a Christian, this is what God calls us to do. But you know, we, we I think sometimes settle for being Christians instead of being disciples. That word disciple simply means student. That's what that word meant. Mathetes, that, that was the word in, in Greek. It, it meant student. And these students would follow around a rabbi or a teacher and they would, they would learn, they would listen. They would soak up everything that this rabbi taught them and they would emulate them, they would act like them and they would try and learn how they thought and dealt with certain situations. And you see Jesus comes and Jesus gets these 12 disciples. And of course we know... He had many more, but these 12, they followed him everywhere, a sort of a living classroom. And they watched how he dealt with people, and they watched how he interpreted God's word. And all they were learning from him, they were to imitate in their own lives. But here in Luke chapter 9, 
Jesus gives the core of what being a disciple is. Jesus gives us the core of what it is to follow him and to live like him. And that is this idea of sacrifice. When we talk about living like Christ, the thing we think most about is is, is being nice to people, loving people, hugging people. When we think about what it means to be like Christ, we often think about it in terms of putting our arm around somebody. But Jesus says that the core of discipleship, what it really means to be a disciple, is found in this one thing of sacrifice. This is what it means. This is how we get all that other stuff is through what Jesus says here of taking up our cross and following him. See, in, in the ancient world, these disciples, these students would go up to the teachers and they would accept the yoke of the teacher. And you can remember as Jesus even mocks the teachers of the day and their adherence to Judaism. He, he, he talks about how they they're, are, are burdensome and, and they bring heavy burdens to people. But what does Jesus say? Come and accept my yoke for it is light. It's freeing. And so as we look today, I want us to see how this, this, this life of sacrifice that Jesus calls us to is the path to discipleship and taking on the yoke of Jesus. We see the first thing is that a disciple confesses Jesus' identity. Jesus asks, what do the crowds say about me? Who do people say that I am? And the disciples speak, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say you're like John the Baptist. Others say you're like Elijah. Others say that, that you're one of these old prophets. In essence, they're saying that, that Jesus was a prophet. Now, in Jewish thought, a prophet was somebody who was sent by God to speak from God. And they revered these prophets. They revered men like Moses and Elijah. Even John the Baptist had somewhat of a following. But Jesus knew he was more than a prophet. Jesus was not here just bringing a message from God. Jesus was not just here to speak to the issues of the day. Jesus was not here to confront politicians. Jesus was not here to change the, the, the structure of government, to get rid of the Romans. Jesus was here to do more than that. And so Jesus then narrows in and he asks, Who do you say that I am? And Peter, on behalf of the group, speaks up and Peter says, You are the Christ of God. Now this term Christ, it is, it is not, we often think of Jesus Christ, we think of Christ as somewhat like Jesus' last name, but Christ is his title. To be the Christ meant he was the Messiah. He was the one sent by God to deliver the people. He was the one who was bringing victory and salvation. And so when Peter says, you are the Christ of God, Peter is not saying you're a good prophet, you're coming to bring good teachings. Peter is not saying that, that what you're doing is just changing society. Peter is saying, you are God himself. You are the one sent to rescue us. You are the king of kings. See, Jesus asked for a personal confession, though. The reality is, is it doesn't matter what other people think about Jesus. What matters is what you think about Jesus. What matters is what I think about Jesus. We can sit and we can talk about the way our society views Jesus. We can talk about how Islam views Jesus. We can talk about how Mormons view Jesus or Jehovah's Witnesses view Jesus. We can talk about how the average person in Salem thinks of Jesus. But none of that matters as much as what you think about Jesus. What I think about Jesus. The time comes for all of us when we have to make a personal declaration of who we believe Jesus is. And what we think about Jesus determines everything. See, if we simply think that Jesus is a prophet, if we simply think that Jesus is one who comes and who speaks on behalf of God, he's just a prophet, we have the luxury of picking and choosing what we like, don't we? 
if Jesus is just a messenger, then we can take some things Jesus says that we like. We can take the stuff about loving each other and we can keep that. And we can get rid of the stuff like sell everything you own and follow me. I don't like that. That's too harsh. Standards too high. And this is the way a lot of people think about Jesus. You hear people say, well, Jesus was a good teacher. Jesus was a good rabbi. The things that he taught, it was a good way to live. But what was the core of Jesus' teaching? The core of Jesus' teaching wasn't ethics. The core of Jesus' teaching wasn't moralism. The core of Jesus' teaching was that he was the Son of God. He was God himself. And if we don't accept that, then nothing else Jesus says matters. That's why you have what what C.S. Lewis called the trilemma. Either he's Lord, or he's a lunatic, or he's a liar. And we all have to decide what we believe about Jesus. And the question ultimately comes down to this. Is Jesus the message, or is Jesus just a messenger? Is Jesus the message himself? Is he the way, the truth, and the life? Is he the word of God in flesh? Or is he just a messenger sent by God? See, if Jesus is the message, then we have to submit ourselves to everything he says and everything he is. We have to accept and we have to follow everything Jesus tells us and everything he calls us to do. It's interesting to me, when you look through the Gospels, who was it that Jesus was rejected by? He was rejected by the moral leaders of the day, the religious leaders of the day, and the politicians. And it's these same three areas where we try and, and we try and change Jesus instead of accepting Jesus. You think about how we try and fit Jesus into our religion sometimes. You say, Michael, how can we fit Jesus into religion? Jesus is religion. We, we try and change Jesus and, and transform Jesus so Jesus, he, he adheres to our idea of religion. I remember several years ago, there were all those bracelets that were really popular, the what would Jesus do? And in principle, that's a good thing, but it doesn't always work, does it? I remember I, I was working as a video store clerk and... One customer was just really adamant that they weren't going to pay their late fees. And they just were being really rude. And so I kind of dug my heels in a little bit. And they looked and they pointed. And they saw my what would Jesus do bracelet. And they said, "Uh, what would Jesus do? I said, he will return one day with a flaming sword and judge people. (laughs) That's what Jesus is going to do. That's what I'm doing now. (laughs) Guilty you got to pay. It doesn't always work. We try and take our concept of Jesus and we fit it into our religion. And you hear a lot of these denominations and a lot of these churches today as they, they are fitting Jesus into their idea of religion and their idea of morals. Well, Jesus never said anything about this. Well, Jesus did this. And they don't look at the whole context of Scripture. In essence, they just make Jesus whomever they want Him to be so that they can endorse whatever they want to endorse. They can do whatever they want to do. And we do that. We we take Jesus when He is convenient and we use Him to condemn others sometimes and sometimes we use Him to elevate ourselves. Sometimes we take Jesus and we want to fit him into our political ideology. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. Everybody seems to have Jesus on their side, don't they? Well, Jesus would want this, and Jesus would want this legislation. No, Jesus would oppose this legislation. Listen, Jesus has come and Jesus speaks for himself through God's word. And when we try and take him and we try and squeeze him into our our own boxes of ideology and opinions, he is not Lord. Jesus wants a personal confession from us. He wants a personal declaration from all of us. Who do we say that he is? 
and when we declare who he is, that really has to change the way we view everything. And if we declare with, with Peter and with the disciples, you are the Christ of God then what we are saying is we are submitting ourselves to you fully, to everything you say and to everything you call us to. And if we confess Jesus as Lord, if we confess Jesus as Master, then as disciples, our lives have to conform to Jesus' pattern of life. I want you to see what Jesus says there. Because they say, you are the Christ of God. You are the King of kings. And Jesus says, you are right. I am the King of kings. I am the King bringing God's kingdom. And the King must die. Now this would have been offensive. This would have been strange. People would not have fully understood this because... The idea of the Messiah in Jewish thought was that the Messiah was triumphant. The Messiah, I mean, he is one of these action heroes who comes in with guns blazing, kicking down doors, and he is, he is telling people to bow down before him. This idea of a Messiah who comes and who dies would have been so strange and so foreign. But Jesus does not just say, I will die. Jesus does not say, I'm going to die. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, I must die. Why would Jesus say that he must die? Why does Jesus have to die? Uh, I think there's several reasons. The first reason Jesus has to die is because of a personal necessity. The reality is, is all of us want to be loved it's what we all want. Today on Father's Day, there are many people who celebrate a father who loved them, a father who cared for them, a father who, who protected them, who taught them, who prepared them for life. But sadly, there are a lot of people today on Father's Day who are confronted with a feeling of emptiness because they didn't know their father, didn't have a good father had a strained relationship with their father, and their whole lives have been spent pursuing that love that they so desire from a father. There are two kinds of love in this world. One is a conditional love, a love that takes somebody and, and, and in essence, uses them to get something. We love some people. We love to be around some people, but in the back of our minds the whole time we're around them, we're thinking about what we can get. We want something from them. We want attention from them. or We want what they will get us. and We want them to help us. We, we want them to do something for us. And so we, we go through life and we have all these relationships built on this conditional form of love. And of course, they all will eventually deteriorate. And then there's this unconditional love, the love to which we, we aspire, the love we so desperately crave, a love that does not seek anything from us, a love that simply wants to give to us, a love that is not based upon anything, a love that does not change regardless of what we do, regardless of what we say and how we act, a love that is not conditioned upon anything other than the act of love itself. This is what we all crave. Ironically, of course, because of our sin, it's something that we're incapable of giving all the time, too. We're inherently selfish people. And every one of our relationships, no matter how good, ultimately that, that, that conditional love begins to creep up. You say, oh, no, no, it doesn't. Yeah, it does. Think, think about your relationship with your kids. When they don't do what you want them to do, what's your response? Are you calm in addressing them and in caring for them and helping them see what they need to do, or do you get frustrated? Do you get angry? Do you feel hurt? Again, it's a conditional form of love. And because of our sin, that, that, is, that is how we love. And one of 
the, the most difficult but important things for us to understand as Christians is that God does not need us. People sometimes bristle at that concept that God does not need us. God didn't create us because he was lonely. God didn't create us because he was bored. God doesn't need us to accomplish his purposes. Do you remember what Jesus says? Jesus says if we don't praise him, what's going to happen? The rocks are going to cry out. Why then would God create us? Why then would God save us if he doesn't need us? Because he loves us. And Jesus' death is a demonstration of what unconditional love looks like. Jesus, as John says in 1 John, Jesus showed us love in this way, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died to show us true and unconditional love. What we see on the cross of Jesus, why Jesus must die, is so that we could see graphically just how much God loves us and how much God wants a relationship with us. God didn't need us. God didn't need to save us. But God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die so that we could have a relationship with him. And we have this personal necessity for love, and Jesus had to die to show us what love was. But there's also a legal necessity that caused Jesus to die. See, sin created a debt. When we sin against the God who created us, when we sin against the Lord of the universe, when we sin against God, a debt was incurred, and that debt has to be paid. Some people say sometimes, well, why can't God just forgive us? Why can't God just act like it, it never happened, like it's no big deal? That sure seems petty of God. Let me put it to you this way. If you invite us over to your house and Henry uh, is being a little rambunctious and he runs around and he bumps into one of your end tables and a lamp falls off and the lamp breaks. And I say, well, let me, let me pay for that. And you say, oh, no, it's... Kids will be kids, no big deal. And you say, you don't have to worry about it. Let me ask you something. Is there still a debt? Yeah, there's still a debt. Just because you said don't worry about it doesn't mean there's not a debt. Now there's a dark spot in your living room. Now you're one, you've got one less lamp. There's still a debt. Just by you saying don't worry about it doesn't mean that it's like it never happened. The Bible says that when we sin, we brought, we brought death with us. Sin is not just something bad we do. Sin is a violation. It is an affront to God's whole plan. And when sin entered into the world, death entered into the world. Disease entered into the world. That's why Paul says that all of creation groans for redemption. Because when sin entered into the world, everything changed. Death and decay, all those creaking bones we feel in the morning when we wake up, all those sore muscles we feel after working in the yard, that's because sin is in the world. And if God simply says, don't worry about it, I'm going to act like you never sin, you can still come to heaven, but the debt is never paid, the consequences of sin The debt of sin is never dealt with, is it? It's still there. If we want to exist one day without the threat of sin and the effects of sin, which is what we heard the choir sing about that city one day, where there is no more death and there is no more sickness and there is no more pain and there is no more hurt and there is no more sorrow, the only way that can ever be possible is if that debt is paid. And Jesus came as representative of humanity to stand in your place and in my place to pay that debt. And Jesus came as fully God to pay the debt for all people of all time so that that no one would go to hell because of what Adam did. Jesus died for everyone so that that debt is taken away from Adam. 
And that sin will one day fully and finally be conquered and taken care of. Jesus had to die because of this legal necessity that we all face. But Jesus also died because there was a sacrificial necessity. See, Jesus couldn't have died in just any old way. If Jesus had just died in his sleep peacefully, it wouldn't have mattered. Jesus had to die as a sacrifice. His death had to be a violent one. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. Jesus' death had to be bloody. See, in the Bible, blood symbolizes death, but it symbolizes the taking of life, not the natural end. Whenever you see blood mentioned, it's not just something dying passively. That's why uh, when the sacrifices were offered, you didn't just take a lamb who had just died. There had to be a lamb who was killed. There had to be this ending of life to show you understood that what sin brought was death, that what sin caused was death, and blood had to be spilled And Jesus came and Jesus died as a sacrifice to pay the debt of sin. But Jesus also died as a sacrifice to show something. See, Jesus came into the world sinless and perfect. Jesus came into the world to stand up for justice, to do what it says in in Micah, to, 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 to love mercy and, 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 and truth and, and justice. And, and, and Jesus came and Jesus died at the hands of those who should have been standing up for justice. But because Jesus gave himself up, Jesus didn't try and assert his authority. Jesus didn't try and lord over anybody. Jesus did not cause people to bow down, but Jesus humbly gave himself up. Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice. Jesus was showing the triumph of good over evil because Jesus did not fight fire with fire, but fought sin and hell and Satan by humbly giving himself up as a gift of love. Jesus showed that God's way will ultimately and must ultimately be triumphant. And Jesus must, Jesus said, I must die because of our personal need, because of our legal need, and because of this sacrificial need. In sacrificing himself, Jesus revealed the true character of God. And since Jesus gave his life for his disciples, we as his disciples must give our lives to him. See, if our master suffered, it should follow that we as his disciples will suffer. If Jesus denied himself, it should follow that we as those who are his students, who learn from him and who follow him, we're going to encounter suffering. This notion of any sort of Christian life that that avoids all forms of suffering and sees suffering just as punishment does not really understand what following Jesus means. Several years ago, there was a a church in New York City that was broken into. And in the front of this this church, the Church of the Holy Cross, there was a large cross with this, this ornate statue of Jesus on it. And the body of Jesus was made of ivory, and he had he had gold on him. And some thieves, they took that body of Jesus off the cross. And in the New York Times, as they reported on this story, they interviewed. The, the groundskeeper of the church. And he said, he said, well, what was strange to him is he always thought if you took the crucifix, you took the whole thing. So I've never seen somebody take Jesus without taking the cross. But that's precisely the way so many of us want Jesus. We want the blessings, but we don't want the suffering. We want the Christ. We want the victory, but we don't want the cross. But what Jesus is showing us here in Luke is that victory only comes through suffering. That the path to discipleship only comes through hardship. 
And that if we want Jesus, we've got to take the cross too. And Jesus says how it is that we lose ourselves to find Him. He says there in verse 23, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's it. It's the path to discipleship. You want to know how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? You want to know how to follow Jesus Christ? This is it. Jesus says it very plainly, very simply. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So how is it that we lose ourselves in Christ? The first thing we have to do is we have to deny ourselves. We have to, we have to, to not make life about us. Life is not about our comfort. Life is not about our happiness. Life is not about our satisfaction or our dreams being fulfilled. If we really want to follow after Christ, we have to come to the point where we are not the main thing in our own life. Let me ask you, how is it that a crucified Savior could be served by a self-centered and self-indulgent people? If we say that what we are is we are disciples of Jesus, the Christ of God, how is it that we can say that we follow a Christ who was crucified if everything in our life is about us? If we're only happy when things go the way we want and we're only content when we have what we think we need and we're only satisfied when we feel appreciated. If our Savior came and He lived this life of sacrifice, if He lived this life of self-denial, this life where He was not the main thing, but the glory of God and the souls of others were what were most important to Him, how can we say we're following Him if all we care about is ourselves? Jesus' definition of power was countercultural. Because the way that, that, that the Romans, the way that the Jews defined power was by getting from others what you need from them, making them do what you need. If you have power, if you're in control, you can make others do what you want, and you can have others serve you, and you can have others perform whatever you, you call them to do. But you see what Jesus' idea of power is? Jesus' idea of power is not in having others do for you, it's in doing for them. Jesus says there, he says, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Jesus is saying if we spend our life trying to clutch at the things of this world, if we find our satisfaction in having things and having status, you know what's going to happen? Eventually we're going to die. Sarah and I were just in Washington, D.C., and we went to the Smithsonian there, and there, were a, there was a room full uh, of stuff about the presidents. You know what? None of them have any power anymore. They're dead. And even those who are still alive, they're not in the Oval Office. They had their, the, they call it the football, that briefcase that has like all the nuclear codes and stuff that they carry around. Uh, that used to belong to Bill Clinton. Guess what? He doesn't have that power anymore. If our whole life, if, our, if the success and joy of our life is determined by trying to hold on to the things of this world, eventually we will lose all of them. But if our life is in giving ourselves up, it is in denying ourselves so that we can follow God and we can serve others and we can honor Him through being a blessing to people. Jesus says that is how you make your life count. That is how you find meaning and fulfillment that cannot and will not be taken away. Only when we submit our lives to Christ and to His kingdom will our lives really count. We have to deny ourselves. We have to take up our cross. We make light of this. We talk about bearing our cross. Yeah, I'm going over to the mother-in-law's today. It's just my cross to bear. 
we, we talk about bearing the cross like it's something silly. Do you know in, in Roman society, you weren't allowed to talk about crucifixion at the dinner table? Because it was so reviled and so violent. It's not what, it's not what proper people talked about. Crucifixion is a means of execution. It's a means of torture. A means of a violent death. And when Jesus says that we need to take up our cross daily, he's not saying you just got to get through those things you don't like. Taking up your cross was total submission to the state. It was when these prisoners, in full obedience to the state, began to march to their death. And, and Jesus is saying if we really want to follow him every day we live, we live in total and complete submission to him, doing whatever he calls us to do, whatever it may cost us. To bear one's cross is to die to self and, and pursue obedience to Christ, whatever the cost. Listen, bearing your cross doesn't bring with it cost analysis. When God calls you, to give sacrificially of your time to help at Camp Joy, to help at VBS. You don't go, but there are other things I need to do that week. If we are bearing our cross, we are saying, whatever you say, Lord, whatever it's going to cost me. To bear our cross is to say we will go anywhere and do anything God calls us to do because He is in control, and we will leave the consequences up to Him and trust Him for that. You know, this, this at the Southern Baptist Convention, they had three Cuban pastors come and, and report to the convention about what God is doing in Cuba. And where my dad has worked with the International Mission Board, he's got to go down to Cuba and work with these guys. They're not allowed to build churches in Cuba. You have to have a house church. But the amazing thing is, is it is exploding right now. God is working in tremendous ways in this country that has been so close to the gospel for years. They couldn't report, but one of these pastors who was up there, as they were giving their Fort Dadlings over to me, he's baptized Fidel Castro's son. And I can't say that publicly. I mean, I'm not even supposed to say it now, but God is at work. Why is he at work? How is he at work? Because these people, the, these pastors said, you know, the thing that's so important is people understand when you join the church, when you get saved, you are saying up front, God, whatever you have is mine. You understand that to join this church is to volunteer that when the current house they're meeting in, it gets too, too full, you may be next to have your house used for a church. You understand that what this means is you are putting your life on the line. You are putting your freedom. You are putting your financial security on the line to follow Jesus Christ. And because these people say every day, I am willing to bear my cross, the gospel is moving throughout Cuba in magnificent ways. We need to be people who say, whatever it is God calls me to do, I am willing to do this. But let me just caution you. You cannot have a cross on one shoulder and a chip on the other. When you say, I am going to bear my cross, it's not bearing your cross if you're complaining about obedience the whole time you're doing it. It's not bearing your cross if you're fussing. You begrudgingly give your time and your, your resources you go over to your neighbor simply because you feel like you have to. You show up at church just because you're afraid of what will happen if you don't. To bear your cross is to, to follow Jesus whatever he tells us to do, no matter the cost. But then finally, we have to follow God continually. Jesus says, we deny ourselves and we take up our cross and we follow him. Discipleship is about abandoning our identity so that we can receive Christ's identity. It's, in, it's interesting. Jesus uses the word here that does not speak of physical life. It speaks of identity. It speaks of personhood. Jesus is not saying that, that, that you will lose your life, your, your physical life. Jesus is talking about your identity. 
in every culture, no matter where you go in the world, every culture has those things that people can do or that people can have that, that bring with it certain status and bring with it certain admiration. And Jesus is saying there that if we, we clutch at those things, if we gain the whole world, but we lose our identity, what does it profit us? What does it matter if we've got all the stuff in the world, but we don't have this identity in Christ? He is saying the way we gain is through losing our identity in Him. Jesus went to the cross and lost His identity so that we could have it. There Jesus, as the sinless Son of God, became sin. God turned His back on His Son for a moment. God forsook His Son and in fulfillment of Psalm 22. And God poured out His wrath on Jesus. And Jesus, in that moment, suffered an eternity of separation from God. So that you and I, by putting our faith in what Jesus has done... God does not see us in all our sinfulness. God does not see us in all our self-centered rebellion. God sees the perfect, spotless Son of God. He sees Jesus Christ. And we stand before God one day, and we don't boast about what we have done or who we are, but we stand before Him and say, I put my faith in Jesus. I am in Jesus Christ. I denied myself. I took up my cross and followed Him, and because of what He has done, God does not see us, God sees Jesus. Listen, it's not just a matter of saying, I've been a failure, I've sinned, I need to change things. I'm going to go to church, I'm going to be a moral, decent person, I'm going to start living like Jesus. That's not the point, because all that does is change one performance-based identity for another performance-based identity, where we think that if we just do enough good, God will somehow accept us. The only way God accepts us is if we change our identity and by faith in Jesus Christ accept His. And God declares us as sons. I like what C.S. Lewis says. He says, It is when I turn to Christ, When I give myself up to his personality, that I finally begin to have a real personality all my own. Nevertheless, you must not go to Christ for the sake of a new self. As long as your own personality is what you are bothering about, you are not going to him at all. Hear what Lewis is saying. Lewis is saying, if you're just going to Jesus for something new, to try something new, you're not really going to him. The way we go to him is when we completely deny ourselves and we lose ourselves in him. When we say, Jesus, whatever it is you do, whatever it is you call me to, that is who I want to be. I trust completely and totally in what you have already done for my salvation. We have to stop making life about what we want and we have to make life about what God wants. We have to be a people who say that unless we have Jesus, life is meaningless. But because we have Jesus, nothing is meaningless. Because we are His, everything we do has purpose. And everything we do, we do in submission and obedience to Him. Here's the question. If someone gave themselves up for you, how can you not give yourself to them? There was a great hero of World War II whose name was Hidden for many years because of the communist regime in Poland. His name was Witold Pilecki. Witold Pilecki was uh, involved in the Polish underground. And as the Germans had taken over there in Poland and built Auschwitz, Pilecki had heard rumors about what horrors were going on there. And nobody would listen. And so Pilecki volunteered himself to go into Auschwitz to become a prisoner in order to let the world know what was happening there. And so finally, with the help of the government, Pilecki went, he got a false identity card, he was, was identified as a Jew, and he was imprisoned there at Auschwitz as prisoner 4859. For three years, Pilecki was a prisoner there in Auschwitz. He worked as hard as all the other prisoners, He endured all the beatings, all the torture, all the humiliation. 
Pilecki began to work behind the scenes and he began to, to sneak and steal certain parts and he built a radio and was communicating with the Polish uh, military from inside Auschwitz telling them what had going on. He had estimated that over two million people had been killed by this point. His word began to spread throughout Europe and even the rest of the world and people understood the horrors of what was going on there in this concentration camp. People began to mobilize and Pilecki eventually began to work in the kitchen and one day he found his opportunity and, and he subdued a guard and broke out so that, that he could, could tell others and could testify. One Jewish journalist summarized it like this. Once he set his mind to the good, he never wavered. He never stopped. He crossed the great human divide that separates knowing the right thing from doing the right thing. I read that story, and that sounds so similar to what Jesus did, doesn't it? That Jesus came, and Jesus saw our need, and Jesus made himself one of us. And he came, and he took on all of our suffering. He took on all of the pain of hum humanity. He endured all the temptations that Satan could throw at him, and Jesus never wavered. Jesus never wants sin. Jesus always fulfilled what God's plan was for his life. And Jesus came and Jesus lived among us so that he could die for us and could rescue us from our sin and from ourselves. And what discipleship means is that we enter into suffering for the sake of others. You want to know how to be a good husband? Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow him. You want to know how to be a good father? Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow him. You want to know how to be a good employee? Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow him. You want to know how to be a good friend? Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow him. See, at the core of whatever it is God calls us to do, at the center of whatever it is God's purpose for our life involves, is always this process of denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following Him. And if we want to be disciples, if we want to live like Christ, if we want to go into this world and endure the things of this world so that we can rescue people from their sins and we can rescue people from themselves, it all happens when we say we will deny ourselves and we will take up our cross and we will follow him. Let's bow our heads. Maybe you're here this morning and you understand that you're not a disciple because you've never put your faith in what Jesus has done. You've never trusted in Him. You've never accepted the sacrifice that He has offered on your behalf. Today, as you understand why Jesus had to die, Jesus had to die for me and Jesus had to die for you. And you understand your only hope is by putting your faith in what Jesus has done. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Michael, that's what I need. I need to be a disciple and I need Jesus as my master. I need to trust in what he has done for me. When we sing our song of commitment, maybe you just want to come talk to me. We'll have some men here at the front that you can talk to about what it means to know you put your faith in Jesus Christ and what it means to follow him with your life. Maybe you're here this morning and you say you know that you're a Christian. But for too long you've wanted Christ without the cross. You've wanted blessings, but you haven't wanted suffering. And this morning you understand that the path to discipleship, the path to being who God calls you to be only comes through denying yourself and taking up your cross and following Him. That this is what Jesus modeled in, in His own life. And if we truly want to be His followers, if we truly want to be His disciples, this must be what we do. Maybe during this song, you just want to commit yourself to 
being a disciple. Say, I'm not content with just being a Christian. I'm not content with just knowing where I'm going to spend eternity, but I want to serve God now. I want to be used of God now. I want to be a blessing to people now. I want to reach Salem. I want to reach Dent County. I want to reach Missouri. I want to reach the world now. And you say, I need to be a disciple. I need to live like Jesus. Maybe you want to pray where you are. Come to the front and pray. Pray with prayer. Whatever God's calling you to do. But God is showing us how it is we fulfill what his plan for us is. The question is, will we cross over that chasm from knowing what is right to doing what is right? Lord, thank you for Jesus and thank you for the love that he has offered us. Thank you for the sacrifice that he made of himself so that we could have a relationship with you. I pray we do not take that for granted. And I pray, Lord, that as we trust in what he has done, we show our, our love and our appreciation for Jesus. We show our fellowship of Jesus by living like he did, by living this sacrificial, self-denying, cross-bearing, Christ-following life. May that be the passion of our hearts and the burden of every single day. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.